This morning we'll be in verses 18 and 19. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. But when you found that, if you wouldn't mind, just put your finger there and find also 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. So the first verse we'll look at, Proverbs chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. And then we'll uh, reference 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. And when you find that, if you wouldn't mind standing with me to honor God's word this morning. And so that I know that we're all in the same place and on the same page. And while you're looking, I'll tell you the story I heard about two Okies who were walking down the street downtown here in Newkirk when they came across a nun who had her arm in a sling and her hand wrapped in a cast. And uh, so one of the Okies looked at the nun and says, uh, what happened to your arm? And she said, well, I broke it in three places. And the other Okie looks at her and says, well, how'd you do that? And she said, well, I slipped in the bathtub. And with that, they went on their ways. And one Okie looked at the other and said, uh, what's a bathtub? And the other one looked at it and said, well, how would I know? I'm not Catholic. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. The wicked worketh the deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. <coughs> As righteousness tends to life, so he that pursueth evil pursues it to his own death. Let's pray. Grace Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can come together and have uh, the privilege and the responsibility to worship you, Lord. And we pray that you would open our hearts to receive the word. And we, and we pray, Lord, that we'd open our hearts to the moving of the Holy Spirit. We give you honor, praise, and glory this morning. In the name of Yeshua, our salvation, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, most Christians know all about King David's great sin with Bathsheba. If you've been in the church for any time, if you've studied the Bible for any time, you know all about uh, King David's sin with Bathsheba. The Bible says this, at the time when kings go out to war, David tarried in Jerusalem. When David should have been with his men at the front, he was instead uh, lounging on the roof of his palace, and then he noticed a woman who was taking a bath. And she was beautiful. And, and seeing her aroused this sinful desire in his heart, and then from that point, David committed adultery, and then he plotted a conspiracy against an innocent man, one of his own soldiers in his army. And then he committed murder. Now some may try to argue here that Uriah was a soldier in a time of war and that he was killed in battle. But Uriah's death was directly attributable to David's order. David commanded Joab, the commander of his army, to put Uriah in the, in the thickest part of the fight and then pull back away from him, leaving him exposed so that he would be killed. And in the eyes of God, this was no different than if David had struck down Uriah himself. Amen. Amen. Just listen to God's judgment. The judgment pronounced by Nathan the prophet upon King, King David. 2 Samuel 12, verses 9 through 12. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. He didn't say the Amorites did it. He said, Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Because David killed Uriah with the sword of war, the sword of war would never again depart from his house. Because David took the wife of another man, another man was going to take all of David's wife. Listen carefully. I don't want you to miss this. David's judgment here was according to his sin. And in this, God's judgment was perfectly just. But what is more, David's judgment here, according to the word of God, according to God's justice, David's judgment exemplifies this truth. Listen, you're always going to reap in the same kind as you have sown. Amen. Amen. The law of the harvest says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
Now, for he that soweth to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. This law, as with all of God's laws, cannot be avoided. You cannot avoid the law of the harvest. Try as we may, we're not going to go over it. We're not going to go around it. We're not going to go under it or through it. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap of the same kind as you have sown. Amen. Which means whatever you reap with your life, be it spiritual or physical, what you're going to sow is going to be of the very same nature as what you have planted. That's what we're going to learn today as we continue in our study of the law of the harvest. You're always going to reap in the same kind as you have sown. And the reason that I highlight here David's actions in regard to his sin with Bathsheba is because this event here and the consequences are a good example of someone reaping something of the same nature as they have sown. When I say we reap of the same kind as we have sown, that's what I mean. We're going to reap of the same nature as what we have sown. I mean, if you consider David's life, consider David early on in his life, he sowed to the Spirit and he reaped a spiritual reward, didn't he? God lifted him up. Amen. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. King David, we know, is the sweet psalmist of Israel, but then he made this mistake, didn't he? Yes. He made a mistake. A seriously bad decision is what David did, yes. what David made. Now listen. If you don't hear anything else this morning, I want you to hear this. Yes, Lord. If you don't hear anything else this morning, I want you to think about this as you go on your way. It only takes one bad decision to create consequences with which you may have to suffer for a lifetime. Right. It only takes one bad decision to create a lifetime of suffering consequences. So don't be fooled into thinking one little mistake can't hurt you that much. It certainly can one serious mistake, one foolish decision, it can cost you forever until we reach eternity. Amen. It can cost you throughout your lifetime. David made this one bad decision and it affected him, but not only him, it affected his family for generations and generations. David uh, sowed to lust and murder and he reaped of the same for the rest of his life. We noted this last week. One of David's own sons raped his sister, raped David's daughter. Another of David's sons, Absalom, then killed his brother over the same matter. This same son, Absalom, attempted to usurp his father's throne. Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel, in the sight of all Jerusalem. David killed Uriah with the sword of war, and so God declared that war would never depart from his house. And because of this, now listen, here's a lifetime of consequences, even beyond David's lifetime, because of David's actions in all of recorded history since the time of David, Israel has never known any lasting peace. One poor and sinful decision can have consequences that last for generations and generations and generations. But what I want to point to and what is plainly evident here is that what David had sown was of the very same nature as what he was reaping. What we harvest with our lives is going to be of the same nature, of the same kind as we have sown. If we sow good, it's going to lead to reaping good. But if we sow evil and sinfulness, it's going to lead to reaping evil and sinfulness. Amen. Can't get around that. No matter how hard you try. You are never going to get around the laws of God. Amen. Proverbs 11, 18 and 19. The wicked works a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursues it to his own death. Listen, if you reap good, if you sow good, you're going to reap good. If you sow evil, you're going to reap evil. The Bible says it again and again and again. You're going to reap what you sow if you so good, you're going to reap good. If you sow evil, you're going to reap evil. Reaping of the same kind is known as the principle of natural reproduction. The principle of natural reproduction, it's plainly seen in the natural order of creation. The biblical truth that you're going to reap of the same nature, of the same kind as you've sown, is clearly evident throughout all of nature. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhood, so that they are without excuse. Listen, the book of Genesis puts forth the natural order of creation. The book of Genesis puts forward the natural order of creation. I remember a story I just read this morning. A farmer had missed church on Sunday because he, he had not gotten all his wheat harvest in. Some of you guys raised wheat and corn and all those things. You know how it is. So the pastor was um, a little concerned that uh, one of his members had missed church. And he went out to the farm. And, and he knocked on the farmer's door. And he said, hey, I, I noticed, uh, Brother Jim, you weren't at church last Sunday. And Brother Jim said, well, you know, I didn't get all the harvest in. And I had to finish with the harvest. And the preacher said, you know, God created the earth in six days. And so the farmer said, yeah, but he got done. <laughs> the book of Genesis puts forth the natural order of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. And God created great wells and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. Listen, every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing. And the beast of an earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. And the cattle after their kind. And everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Did you notice that phrase that came up again and again as it was describing the order of creation? What was it? After his kind. After their kind. That is the principle of natural reproduction. Listen, uh, you always reap in the same kind as you have sown. God created all the species of plant and animal after its own kind because every species of life can only reproduce after its own kind. The principle of natural reproduction. And that's according to the Bible. And that's what God calls right. That's what God calls good. And God said it was good because God is a God of order and order in the creation is good. When we see things uh, being uh, giving birth after their kind, when we see things uh, sowing after it, uh, reaping after you sown of the same kind, uh, that is good. Imagine what life would be like if God was not a good God of order, and if, if things did not produce of the same kind as they were. I mean. Imagine what it would be like if you went out and planted corn and you went out there after a couple of weeks instead of corn growing, you had butter beans. That would be chaos, wouldn't it? And, and, and if that was the way things were, you, you, you couldn't count on anything in this world. Imagine what life would be like if you couldn't count on the law of natural uh, reproduction. It would be chaos. You couldn't depend on anything. But God never created chaos, folks. God is a God of order. And he's blessed us with a well-ordered creation. You always reap in the same kind as you sow. Here's one absolute truth, and you're never going to be able to display, uh, disprove this, folks. One absolute truth here. A cat will not ever give birth to a dog. <laughs> Listen, folks. An amoeba does not then produce fish that then produce amphibians that give way to mammals which in time become men. No. No. <laughs> My dad used to say, evolution goes like this. Once I was an amoeba in the sea, then I was a monkey in a tree, and now I'm a PhD. It's never <laughs> going to happen, folks. <laughs> fish don't give birth to reptiles. Monkeys do not give birth to men. The principle of natural reproduction upon which all of life is ordered. Listen, the principle of natural reproduction upon which all of life is ordered has never been refuted. It has never been disproven. No man has ever witnessed one species evolving into another different kind of species. That's so easy to understand. It seems a shame that you have to preach it. <laughs> you don't get one kind from another. Now, there are variations within kinds. Amen? Yeah. When it comes to dogs, there are a lot of different varieties of dogs. But guess what? They're all still dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Same thing applies to everything in the plant and animal kingdom. 
There are many variations within times, but what we've never seen and what we're never going to see are dogs transitioning into cats or whales transitioning into dogs or, listen, men transitioning into women. It's never going to happen. You don't get one kind from another. There are variations within kinds, but no transformational states exist. But that's the nonsense that is taught in evolution. That one thing, over time, given enough time, chance, random happenings, will become something completely different. It has never happened. You've got to be a fool to believe something like that. we got a nice pulpit up here. I've been hoping and praying that over time it will transition into a 65 Mustang Genie. It's <laughs> not going to happen, is it? <laughs> you know what this means, folks? It means that the theory of evolution is nothing more than an attempt to make a mockery of God's good order. Yeah, 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 yeah. The theory of evolution is not some alternate theory to explain how life began. It is a demonically inspired attempt to make a mockery of God's creation. And anyone who allows themselves to be led astray by that theory, they are not wise. As a matter of fact, the Bible says you are a fool. The principle of natural reproduction, you reap in the same kind as you have sown, has never been abridged. But there are people who are trying to challenge this principle. Uh, according to the Institution for Creation Research, the Institution for Creation Research, in the 1920s, there was a Russian scientist by the name of Ilya Ivanov. And he uh, performed a series of experiments. He was intending to prove Darwinian evolution, and he was going to, uh, he, 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 he was going to prove Darwinian evolution through attempting to produce a human and ape hybrid animal. Now listen... Charles Lee Smith writes this. The objective of Ivanov's experiments was to achieve artificial insemination of the human and anthropoid species to support the doctrine of evolution by establishing a close kinship between man and higher apes. See, Ivanov was a pioneer in the science of artificial insemination, uh, animal husbandry, and uh, he successfully crossbred a mouse and a rat. And he successfully crossbred a zebra with a horse. And so he figured this, that since humans and apes were so closely related, according to evolution, not to God, okay? But according to evolution, since humans and apes were so close, closely related, that he could crossbreed them as well. So first, he attempted human-male chimpanzee-female hybrids. And so he inseminated female chimps with human matter. And the end result, listen folks, every one of the chimps that he experimented on died. So then next he attempted eight male human-female hybrids, uh, with the result being, listen, those five women that he experimented on, they too died. Because you don't make a mockery of God's created order. Amen. Now Ivanov was successful with mice and rats because they're what? That's right, they're rodents. And he was successful with horses and zebras because they're what? Same Equines, same species. But a human being and an ape are not the same kind. Human beings and apes do not share the same nature. And I'm going to show you why. Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. We've read how that explains how God created the natural order. God created the natural order, everything according to its kinds. All things, whether plant or animal, are created, created according to their kind. Now listen to what the Bible says of, of our created order when it comes to man. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Listen, don't miss this. We have been created at a substantially higher order than the rest of creation. We are the crown of creation. We're not created in the likeness and image of the fish of the sea. We're not created in the image or likeness of the beast of the field. We are created in the image of God. Okay, preachers, then explain to me how it is that, that we have so many things in common with the animals that we live with on this earth. Because we live together on the earth. God did not create the earth as an environment for the animals, you see. God created the earth as an environment for the crown of his creation. That's us. It's ours. And he gave it to us. 
The reason why we have things in common with the animals around us is because we breathe the same air, we eat the same food, we live in the same environment. Any child could see that and understand. How absurd is it to believe that one kind of something can change into a totally different kind of something? How absurd would it be to think that if you could go out there and plant wheat, you're going to grow sugar beets? How absurd is it to believe that apes can give birth to human babies when God created everything according to its own time and he put us as the crown of his creation? And if you're thinking that you're the same as animals out there, get out of that thinking you're lowering yourself. All human beings are created in the image of God. And this is the way the Holy Spirit took this message. It's the way we're going to go. When you look at the created order of things, when you look at how God has created animals and human beings, racism is irrational. Amen. That should have gotten an amen. amen. Racism is irrational because all human beings are created in the image of God. There are variations within the human race. But rest assured, rest assured here, there's only one kind of human being. Amen. If this was not true, that what our culture, then what our culture defines as uh, interracial couples, if there were different races of human beings, then interracial couples would not be able to re reproduce. Amen. Listen, if we were different races or different kinds of beings, then, then a, the white man and an Asian woman would not have children together. All right? So the term race, when applied to different variations within the human species, that is a misnomer. It's a lie. We're not different races. We're all the human race. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. There's only one race, folks. Only one race. Only one human species. And we're all created in the image of our creator. And, and get this. Every variation that we see within man today, all the genetic information needed to produce the various kinds of mankind that we see today, all of this DNA was present in the genetic makeup of Adam and Eve, our original ancestors. Yes. So listen, don't miss this. Adam and Eve, they were not white, they were not black, they were not brown, yellow, or red. Their genetic makeup included every element that we see within the variations of mankind today. And so I venture a guess, listen, that if you were to look upon Adam and Eve, you would look upon human perfection. Amen. Because that's what they were. Amen. Human perfection. They would have been the most beautiful human beings you'd ever seen because they were the crown of God's creation. And all the different variations that we see within mankind today, it's not due to evolution, folks. Evolution teaches the continual upward progress of mankind. And you can look at history and see that we haven't been progressing upward. I like what he said about Gandhi. They said, Gandhi, what do you think about civilization? He said, sounds like a good idea. We ought to try it. <laughs> we haven't been progressing upward. All the variations you see within mankind today is due to a loss of genetic information over time. You see, when God scattered mankind over the face of the earth at the Tower of Babel, this caused, now listen, over time, this caused genetic variation in man to become more prominent, just like we see in variation in animals. Why? Because we live in the same environment, don't we? So you had people, and they made their way north, or they made their way west, or south, or east, and, and, and listen, um, they began to adapt to their environment. So those people who went north, they began to adapt to the cold, the lack of sunlight, which did what? Would cause their skin to lighten. Less melanin would be produced. Guess what, folks? Our skin is all the same color. You just have different levels of melanin. And, and the natural attraction among these people, well, when they went north, were to those who shared the same attributes. And this, of course, had an effect on future generations of genetic makeup. There was a loss of genetic information. And, and, and those who were not suited to a particular environment, either they left and went to one they were more suited to, or they died out and they would leave behind them what would become a variation within the human race. That's how it happened, folks. Same thing happened to those who went in other directions. Those who went east, those who went south, those who went west. The environment shaped the variation of the human species within the con. And there were other factors involved in the development of human variation, of course such as natural and geographic boundaries. 
and personal preferences. But listen, because today we're moving closer and closer to globalization, the world is growing to be a smaller and smaller place, isn't it? Yeah. And we are witnessing the breakdown of the different variations within the human species. The plain uh, fact is we're seeing more interracial couples. Hate that, hate that terminology because it's a lie. But we're seeing more and more interracial couples. And the genetic makeup of our future generations is progressing to have this vast array of genetic material that's available. And, and that's become the norm today. I want you to think about it. All right? When we describe our ethnic makeup, what do we say? Well, if you ask me, what's your ethnic makeup? Well, I used to believe that I was German, Dutch, Irish, and a little bit of Navajo Indian in there. Okay? Then my, brother, my uncle did a DNA test, and boy, that just shook things up. And I said, throw that thing away. I'd rather believe that I'm a little German, Dutch, Irish, and Navajo Indian. That's a whole lot of different genetic material in there. Let, let, let me point something out to you folks, and I'm no scientist, but having studied these things, when you get a pasty white guy like me with brown hair and brown eyes, there's a lot of different genetic material in there. Okay? And here's what I want you to take away from this. You see, we're seeing this today. With, with the breakdown of all this genetic material, we're seeing uh, uh, more and more uh, children being born that are, again, a misnomer, mixed race, but actually what they are are just children who have more genetic material. And, and, and when you look at a couple, say you have a black man and a white woman, and they have children together, and those children come out, and they're absolutely beautiful! You know why? They've got more genetic information than we do. And here's what I want you to take away from this. Racism is irrational. It's irrational. To hate another person because of the color of their sin, that makes about as much sense as hating someone because you think their nose is too big. Or hating someone because you don't like the color of their hair. Most of you ladies hate yourself because of that. Why else would you buy all that hair dye? <laughs> Go out and visit some of you ladies, and I can't. Uh, I, I go out and see some of them, and the hair color changes, and then I, I don't recognize you. And they're like, You don't even recognize me, Pastor. Well, <laughs> racism is nothing more than hatred for the sake of hatred. Amen. Racism is nothing more than hatred for the sake of hatred. And you want to know what the Lord Jesus had to say about that? He said, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And what is racism but being angry, angry without a cause? Being angry without a cause. You know what racism is? Get this down. Racism is unbridled murder in the heart. You look at someone and you hate them because of the color of their skin or hate them because of where they were born or who they were born to. What you do is you don't see the image of God in them. And you equate them as lower than what God created them to be. And because we're all created in the image of God, every human being deserves to be treated with dignity Amen. and respect. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Besides which, if you, you're going to reap what you sow, and if you treat people with respect, you'll get it in return. According to the law of the harvest, if you're sowing hatred, you're going to reap of the same kind. If you're sowing sinfulness and wickedness, you cannot help but reap a harvest of sinfulness and wickedness. If you sow evil, you're going to reap evil because of the principle of natural reproduction. Proverbs 22, 8 says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. I like the English Standard Version. It says, He shall reap sorrow. He that soweth iniquity shall reap sorrow. Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, it says, When you sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. Everybody in Oklahoma knows exactly what that means. You sow to the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind because you're always going to reap of the same kind as you sow. That's the principle of natural reproduction. That's the natural order of things. That's how we know it because that's the way it's always been and that's the way it's always going to be. And of course, you know, sowing and reaping of the same nature, it applies to the good things that we sow as well. If you sow generosity, you're going to reap generosity in return. If you sow blessings, you're going to reap blessings in return. If you sow mercy, you're going to reap mercy in return. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. 
If you sow forgiveness, you're going to reap forgiveness in return. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, listen, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Amen. Forgiveness is not for that person who's wronged you. Forgiveness is for you so you can get on with your life. You're going to reap of the same kind, of the same nature as you've sown. Be it spiritual, be it physical, be it evil or good. That's the way God has designed things to work. That's the way things always work. So I want you to consider what you're sowing with your life. Yeah. Just consider what you're sowing with your life. In our lives, we reap the values, the attitudes, and the character that we've sown. And not only that, not only should you consider what you're sowing with your life, consider well what we're sowing in this church. Mm -hmm. We're here to sow the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can reap, reap a harvest of believers in return. Amen? Amen. This church exists for God's glory. Amen. So if we go out and sow the seeds of the gospel with genuine care and concern for others, no matter what their ethnicity, if God puts someone in your life who doesn't know Jesus, he wants you to tell them about Jesus. Amen. Let him worry about the other stuff. Yeah. And if we sow the gospel with genuine care and concern for others, no matter what their ethnicity, we should expect to see a harvest of souls. Yeah. That's what we're striving for. To see a harvest of souls? Right now, the Holy Spirit is sowing the seed of the gospel in your heart. Right now, the Holy Spirit is sowing the seed of the gospel in your heart. How do you know that? Because I've been right where you are this morning. I've been sitting in the church pew listening to the preacher. And, and though I may not have been paying attention to what the preacher had to say, the Holy Spirit certainly knew how to get my attention. And that's where you are this morning. The question is then, is your heart good ground? The Holy Spirit is trying to sow the gospel into your heart. Is your heart good ground? Are you going to let the gospel take root, germinate in your heart, take root, and produce a harvest of godliness in your life? Amen. That's where you're at right now. If you say yes to the Lord Jesus this morning, he's going to work a work in your life. He's going to work a work in your life. You're going to have your very nature changed. And you're going to start producing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, kindness, gentleness, things which there is no law against. You're going to be saved from your sins. You're going to come to a knowledge of the truth. You're going to be transformed. And all the good that God created in you will come alive. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school. Amen. Is your heart good ground? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will you let God harvest good in you? If the answer is yes to that question, come to Jesus. That's how you do it. You say yes to the Lord Jesus. You just reach out to him and mean it. It doesn't have to be some fancy prayer. You don't have to be polished. You don't have to have a degree in theology to be saved. All you've got to do is be willing to reach out to Jesus with all your heart and say, save me, Lord. I promise you that if you pray and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to save you, and you honestly mean it, you will walk away from this church a believer in Christ, a saved individual this morning. Let's pray. If you want to be saved and you're just not sure how, I'll just lead you in a short prayer. If you'll just pray this with all your heart, I promise you, the Lord Jesus will hear, hear and you will be saved. Just pray with me from your heart, but mean it. Lord Jesus... I want to be saved today. So the best that I know how. Just going by what the preacher said, Lord, I just ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart and my life and change me. Lord, I ask for eternal life in your name and to start living for you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Lord, thank you for this message. I pray that we will take it to heart. Lord, we know that you're the answer to all of our cultural problems that we're having today. And I just pray for a move of the Holy Spirit over us that will break down these barriers of hatred and anger and allow us to love each other in, in the love that you've placed in our heart. Lord, I do pray that you protect our town. I pray that you watch over our town, our area of the world that you've placed us in, Lord, that your love may abound. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me for just a few moments? And the praise band is going to come and sing.